Today we're going to show you how to install a coil shock to a mountain bike. They're a popular upgrade at the moment, especially amongst those favouring gravity orientated riding. Now, although you never need to really adjust anything once they're on a setup, they do take a little bit more to set up than you would an air shock. Here's how you do it. Before we dive into showing you how to do it, I just want to break down the components of a coil shock and a few things you'll need to figure out just to make sure it's definitely compatible on your bike. Now, the back end on suspension bikes will normally have been designed around a coil shock or an air shock, not necessarily for both of them. So you will need to confirm with the manufacturer of your bike that you can use a coil shock on there because generally they have a slightly more linear action than an air shock. Of course, air in a compressed space becomes very progressive. So therefore the suspension design of a bike will be designed around that typically. Now with a coil shock, you don't have the ability to add air or subtract air to change the sag on there. It's all down to the actual spring on there. Now there's two things that come into account here. Your body weight, of course, with your riding bag and all the other stuff on there, comes into effect to determine which spring you will need. But also, the style of bike will affect this as well. Because on an air shock, it's almost infinitely adjustable between two parameters, it's very different with a coil shock, so you do need to do a bit of homework first. I'm actually going to throw a link in the description underneath to a shock calculator. Um, it's to calculate your body weight into a shock, and it works on the wheel travel and the model of bike and stuff that you have. Uh, it's from our friends over at TF Tune Shocks. Uh, but you can put all those details in, and it gives you like the spring weight and dimensions that you're going to need for the shock and the bike of your choice. Uh, that's right down there underneath. Now, looking up close on the shock, the rest of the layout is fairly similar to what you'd expect to see, although it's a different brand, on an air shock. The only difference being on an air shock, you have your air spring on the inside. On a coil shock, you have your spring on the outside. It's a coil. Other than that, the features are fairly similar. You have the main body of the shock, you have this bit, which is a piggyback, and then you have the eyelets at either end. In terms of adjustment on here, you have three main ways to adjust the shock. You've got your rebound dial, which is a red base dial here, and it's typically red across most brands, and blue will be compression. There is a compression dial on this shock, but it's actually activated by a cable and a remote at the levers, but most shocks will typically have a dial on the shock itself. And then, of course, there's the preload. Now, unlike an air shock, where you can adjust like in one PSI increments to get the optimum sag, You'll never get, unless you completely luck out, you won't get 100% the correct sag. You might be very slightly either way of the available spring that you can get for your body weight, in which case you'll then need to adjust some preload. Now you can put up to five turns of preload on a spring. Uh, at least that's what RockShox recommend for their springs. It may be different across manufacturers. Now adjusting preload onto the spring will not change the spring rate. All it does is change the amount of force required to get it moving. Okay, so if you're having to put more than five turns of preload onto a spring, it's not heavy enough for you. You need to go up perhaps 25 pounds or 50 pounds in the weight of the spring, and then in which case you'll probably be running no preload. Uh, so they're not quite as infinitely adjustable. However, the results you can get from these are pretty amazing. Now let's have a quick look at the tools and all the other things that you're gonna need to go with these. Now there's various types of shock hardware available for every shock on the market, and they're all gonna be slightly different depending on which frame they go to. So you'll need to make sure that when you buy your shock, you specify the hardware that you need for it, and that includes the bushings that go into the eyelets of the shock. Now with bushings, there's three or four major styles. There's DP, DU, and then you get like the low friction options. This is a DP bushing, so it's essentially metal and it has a very fine surface on the inside. It's nice and slippy. These push into the actual eyelet of the shock there, and they're nice and they work really well with the hardware. But where these differ to DU bushings and the low friction offerings, are oh, when that surface on the inside wears out, they do run the risk of putting a slight bit of wear on your shock hardware. That's like the bolts and the pins that go through them. However, they tend to last longer in the first place. So it's kind of up to you if you want to go for one of these or something that looks perhaps a bit more familiar to you, like one of the other two offerings. Now, when it comes to the hardware, you need to cater for the fact that, especially with a shock with a piggyback on there, the orientation of the piggyback and at which end of the bike it goes. It won't always be the same. It does depend on the room that you have in your front triangle. Some bikes just simply won't be compatible with having a piggyback on there. In particular, something that's got a smaller frame or a smaller front triangle. So definitely check all these things before you order them. 
Obviously, you're going to need to make sure that the shock is the correct eye-to-eye -eye fitting, that is the length of the shock, and it has the correct stroke on there, that is the amount of travel the shock can offer, uh, to make sure it correlates to the design of your bike so it doesn't affect anything else. Once you've got those things, it's a case of getting the hardware mounted into the shock, and then get the shock on the bike. Now, when it comes to mounting the hardware, you might find, wherever you purchase the shop from, that they'll put the hardware in for you, in which case it makes it super easy to put one on. But if not, and you're going to end up doing it yourself, there are a couple of things you're going to need. And the most obvious one of these is a bush installation tool. Now, these cost around 25 quid. This one's made from hardened steel. A uh, nice bit of kit, and if you're going to do this frequently, when I say frequently, more than once, it's probably worth getting one of these because it's a tool, it's going to last you, and it's the right one for getting the bush in and out successfully without damaging it. You can do this with uh, certain size sockets, but I really wouldn't recommend doing it. That's a last case resort. Get yourself the correct tool for the job, and away you go. In addition to this, you're also going to need relevant Allen keys for your shock and your shock hardware. So normally four, five, six will be the typical variants you'll see there with different hardware across bikes. You're gonna need some blue thread lock just to make sure the bolts can't rattle loose. You might also need uh, some carbon gripper or assembly paste if your bike like this one here has uh, like little flip chips that push into the frame like inserts. Uh, it's good to put in there to make sure they can't creak overuse uh, and a vise is absolutely essential for making sure you can get those bushes into the shock without damaging it otherwise it's a bit of a bodge and you don't want to be doing that okay so i'm just going to install the bushes on the inside of the shock eyelets here uh, when you've got one of these tools it's super simple and actually i do recommend getting one of these if you like to look after your bike at home it's a satisfying tool to use you literally slide the bush on slide it into place put the opposite end of the tool on there with a little tapered end, put it in the vise and then slowly turn it and it basically it comes to a stop and can't go any further. Okay, so we have the bushes in the shock eyelets there. Now I just need to put the actual hardware in place, slide that in, get the relevant spacers on there for your particular frame design. Okay, so that's the core shock prepped, ready for installation. Let's get the old shock off first, shall we? Okay, so rear wheel off first. You don't want any additional weight on the rear end to strain the shock mounts when you actually remove the shock. Um, this one has a cage lock. If yours is a Shimano, turn the clutch off. Just make it easier for yourself to get that rear wheel out. Now something to take into account when you remove your shock from the bike, on some frame designs, this part of the frame can actually foul on your main frame. So, essentially the rear end will want to drop down and if it contacts any part of the linkage you could take some paint off so if that's the case with your bike at that point you want to make sure you get a rag stuff it in there just to make sure no damage can occur at that time now i'm going to do the front bolt first a rear bolt keep your bike a good clean around those shock mounts. Obviously, my bike is pretty dirty, but I wanna make sure the important bits here are nice and clean. There's any interface with the shock. And you might wanna consider taking these little inserts out if your bike has removable ones and putting some fresh assembly compound behind them. Because sometimes they can be one of the culprits that can lead to a creak. Now this one, you can actually flip it either way around to change the geometry. Um, but I'm going to clean that and put a bit of assembly compound on the back. Okay, now it's a case of carefully lining up the shock, making sure you get the correct orientation to suit your frame. Tiny bit of thread lock on the end of the mounting bolts, just to make sure they can't accidentally rattle loose when you're out on the trails. And it's a case of get those bolts in and get them secured. Now note with the shock on the bike, there's a slight bit of movement with the spring here. Now this is the preload ring. I just wanna adjust this until there's no movement. There we go. And then from there, that's when you can make your preload adjustment, which to emphasize the point is five full turns that RockShox recommend you shouldn't go beyond with their springs. This may differ between manufacturers, but to be honest, Anything more than five turns, you're on the wrong spring. 
Okay, so we have the coil shock successfully on the bike and it's ready to start setting up. Now this is where things are a little bit different to an air shock. At this point with an air shock, you attach your shock pump to it and you can infinitely adjust it to get it to the perfect setting for your sag. Now getting the correct sag is really, really important on a bike because of the fact that you can change the whole feel of the bike by having too much or too little. If you have too much sag, you're gonna to sit too deep in the travel and the bike's not gonna feel as responsive, uh, especially in the case of a coil spring. If you're running too soft a coil spring and you're sitting too deep in the travel, the bike will feel really wallowy with not enough mid-stroke support. Uh, that also means your crank's gonna be closer to the floor and yeah, all right, it'll feel great for cornering, but it's gonna feel horrendous everywhere else where you're clipping your feet all the time. And likewise, the opposite can be said if you're having a spring that's too firm. The bike's not gonna be nice and supple across the terrain. Uh, you're essentially gonna be pedaling around a heavy spring with no good reason. So get the sag dialed in correctly. For this bike, we're aiming for 30% of the available travel as sag. Now getting that sag, again, it's also quite different because it's not like an air shock where you can just put the O-ring up against the shaft. It's a little bit different here because it's kind of hard to get a hand on things. Now there's two ways of achieving this. The first one is the old school method where you use the tape measure. Bottom of the saddle to the top of the tire. If you measure in the same place every time, you measure the bike as it is without you on there. And this one has 140 millimeters of rear wheel travel. And then you measure a percentage of that to get your sag when you sit on the bike. Obviously you're gonna have to make a deduction there to get that. Uh, bit of a long way around. On the rock shock shock that we have here, you kind of have a slight cheating method, just like on the air shocks, they have markings on the actual shock itself. So if you look closely, just behind the spring, I can see markings for 40, 30, and 20% available travel. There's a bottom out bumper here, so you could use this in the place of an O-ring. Uh, quite difficult to get my fingers in there, might need to use something else. Uh, if you do use something else, carefully don't scratch the shaft on there. Um, and then set up the sag in the same way that you would with an air shock. But before you do that, you need to know a little thing about coil springs themselves. Now, again, completely different language to, to air shocks here. Coil springs are known for giving you really supple compliant rides, but a downside to coil springs, because of the way they're manufactured, the tolerances differ between springs. Now this could be as little as plus minus 3%, which on a 500 pound spring is probably like 15 pound difference. But even that is quite a big difference. So you could get a 500 pound spring that's actually nearer to like a 485 or something. Like So a big difference really, and you'll end up having to run more preload on there. So if you end up with a spring that doesn't feel quite right for what you think it should be for your body weight, uh, chances are it's gonna be a slightly different variation. So you can actually get some suspension tuners to measure the springs for you, and some of them actually do this with some of the spring manufacturer brands that they actually carry. So that is something worth doing a little bit of homework on uh, if you're not gonna get the perfect sag. I mean, getting it first time with a cool shock, well, you're doing well if you do that, but uh, it is worth persevering because the ride you can get when you get the correct spring is phenomenal. Now, before you start with setting up the sag, you need to make sure the shock is fairly neutral. So that means if you have adjustable compression and rebound on your coil shock, you need to take them out of the equation. So unwind them counterclockwise. Uh, of course, this one has a lever adjustable compression, so that's not actually connected at the moment. You've got a rebound dial here, so counterclockwise all the way. Uh, so there's nothing else affecting your sag. Then you want to carefully just put that bottom out bumper up against the seal and then sit on the bike. Give it a bit of a bounce, same sort of method for an air shock. Now once you're settled, you need very carefully, you might need a friend for this because it's a bit more fiddly with the coil shock, and then very carefully get off the bike and that will give you an indication when you look at the actual shaft here of how much sag you have. Now I'm getting around 28% here rather than the 30, which would be optimal. Uh, but considering I've not got any riding bag or anything on at the moment, that's actually putting me in a good ballpark area. Now with this 500 pound spring that's on this particular shock, I can't unwind it anymore. So I'd either have to go down and add some preload, but given the fact I'm at 28%, I think that's pretty close. Uh, bearing in mind that you can only put a maximum of five turns on. So just to show you what that might do on this 500 pound spring, I've got no turns of preload, I'm running about 28%, so I reckon with the five turns, it'll probably push me the other side of 25%. So let's just give that a try, just so you can get an idea of this. Because with coil springs, you do your work before you put them on the bike, as opposed to air shocks, where you can just adjust them once they're on. So that's my five turns of preload, so if we try the same thing again. No, it doesn't make the shock really feel any different, but it's definitely gonna change the ride height, and it will definitely change the sag. 
So I'll sit on this, I'll probably be near a 25% now, I reckon. And in fact, just over 20%. So it does make quite a significant difference, just to demonstrate there, but really the 500 pound spring for my body weight, about 200 pounds on this bike is nearly perfect. That's good enough for me. Okay, so we have the sag set up on this bike and currently has no damping on there. So the compression damper isn't doing anything currently. I've not got the cable remote on there. So forget this out of the equation, we're gonna deal with the rebound. Now, a good way to get a base rebound setting on a coil shock is simply to jump on the saddle. What you're looking for is for it to not pogo up and down after that initial bounce. So watch this, when I just sit on the saddle quite hard, you'll watch it bounces up and down a few times. This is what you want to remove with that rebound damper. So therefore, not enough damping. So if I put on a few clicks, you'll see it'll make a significant difference. So that's 13 clicks there. So this should make quite a big difference. Much better. Probably go a little bit slower than that. It's 15. That's about perfect, I think. Now the whole concept with the rebound damping is really you want it as fast as possible without making a bike feel like a pogo stick. If you have too much rebound, it's just not gonna return in between impacts and you get what's called packing down where the shock almost successively gets shorter and shorter and you're gonna feel more and more of those bumps. You want it to extend nice and fast, but you do not want it to kick you because it can throw your weight forwards. One of the whole advantages of having a coil shock over an air shock is that once you've set your rebound damping, it will stay predictable because it's not affected by the heat of the shock as it can be with air shocks. Get that nailed and your bike will feel amazing. Okay, so we've got a good base setting for the rebound. Of course, that might change when you head out riding. If you did loads of big jumps and stuff, you might wanna touch more. Uh, and if you're not, perhaps to touch less. Now with the compression, it does differ between shocks. Now, if you bought the shock, especially for your bike, it will be tuned already to have a good base compression on there. And you might find the adjustable compression dial on there will just be for the low speed. And essentially that low speed adjustment uh, will be to help it pedal slightly better so uh, it won't bob up and down quite so much. It will also keep it standing a little bit higher in its travel as well, so that can be beneficial. This particular one has a compression adjuster that's actually got a handlebar remote, uh, which is especially helpful because it puts on loads of low speed compression in one hit. So it's fairly open as it is, click at the lever, puts on loads of compression, so therefore it makes it really good for climbing. Okay, so you have the unsightly cable, but it works a treat. Uh, you can get these as retrofit kits on some other models of shock, but not all shocks out there. Now, if you've got any questions about core shocks and get one set up for your bike, uh, please do let us know in the comments underneath. Hopefully this maintenance video has been of help for some of you, and we'll see you in the next one. See you later.